Last week we had a look at the Intertech C303 mirror case and even if I really liked it, I said that we are going to use the Intertech Thunder case in the 750 euro build just because of a 5 euro shortfall. However, around the time of filming that, Intel released the new generation of their CPUs and probably because of that, AMD CPUs went on sale. So naturally, I opened up all my part spreadsheets and I redid all the calculations and who would have thought I found the 5 missing bugs. This video is brought to you by PDF Element from Wondershare. PDF Element is the perfect PDF reader, editor and creator solution for both macOS and Windows. With its great optical character recognition capabilities, you can analyze PDF files, scan PDF files or just normal image files and convert them into usable PDF files with markable and copyable text. PDF Element also lets you create forms for other people to fill out, pass or protect your PDF files and make them print safe, comment documents and mark paragraphs, make something visible with fancy clouds, combine multiple files within one document and you have easy and quick Dropbox and Google Drive export short links. PDF Element by Wondershare is available with the links in the description below or if you're using macOS you can also download it from the official macOS app store. Make sure to check out the link in the description below for a $60 discount. As we already tried to cram performance into 500 euros, now it's time to do the same with a slightly bigger budget. But the rules stay the same, try to stay as late again as possible and only brand new parts. So let's get started with the big spenders. We chose to stay with the 3600X because it was already overpowered for the other build and a 3700X would end up creating the same issue of having half the budget spent on a CPU while leaving us with a crappy GPU. Of course Team Blue was also considered, but with a 196 price tag there is really nothing you can do. For the other big spender we chose a Palette 1660 Super Gaming Pro. Now there were quite a few alternatives like the RX 5600 XT, a 1660 Ti or 1070 Ti, but everything was either a bit too expensive or too old and looking at price to performance and the fact that we still need some headroom for other parts this was also the easy call. Now there is no real reason why you would need to go with Palette instead of Asus or any other card, but right now, right here where we are, most of the time Palette is the cheapest option. And let's be honest, if you take the exact same card, every brand will be performing somewhat the same as long as you don't compare overclock cards to not overclock cards. And it may not be so obvious, but I am always using Gainward cards in my personal rig out of personal preference and Gainward is owned by Palette, so we will go with the 244 card. With the 380 euros and 55 cents left, we can start tackling the other parts. The RAM for example, we were able to bump it up a bit with two G-Skill Aegis 8GB sticks running at 3000 MHz, so the Ryzen should be happy with those. The mainboard was somewhat of an issue. We tried to have RGB headers present, but those are not available on the B450 platform until you get to somewhere around 90 euros. So unfortunately, we had to compromise on that and we will still use the ASRock B450M Ref4 from the 500 euro build. For storage on the other hand, we were able to switch over to NVMe with Crucial's P1 500GB M.2 drives for around 62.73. Even if the Ryzen comes with a fan for free, we wanted to exchange it for something else. Because even though it is way better than the FX stock cooler, it's still a freaking gel engine. And if we stay in the budget mindset, the Be Quiet Pure Rock Slim is just a great fit and leaves us with 100 euros and 26 cents. Now the power supply we've been using in the 500 euro PC was to say it nicely, not recommended. But Intertech's Argus series, from which we already reviewed the fans, wasn't that bad at all. So we thought, let's give it another shot and we will try our luck with the Argus APS 620 watts for 3382. Something that wasn't present in the last build were fans with RGB. And because I really like the Intertech Argus RS04 RGB kit, we will definitely use it in here. Now as I already mentioned in the beginning, we initially thought we had to use the Thunder case. But even if it is really okay for the price, 
it's nothing compared to the mirror. So I was really glad when I did the recalculations and it turned out that after all, the mirror will fit into the budget, leaving us with a total of 7 cents. But we still got an issue here. If we take a closer look at the power supply, we have here these old looking yellow, red, black, I don't know whatever else, cables. Now this is nothing even close to being an issue, but we are building here a somewhat appealing system. So the remaining 7 cents will be counted as the spray paint that we will be using to fix this issue. Okay, so with the specs out of the way, with the issue resolved, let's get over to building this thing. So now that this is also done, I must say that building within the mirror case is a pleasure if you compare it to like the Thunder case or the B48 case and it just looks amazing. And the paint job, even though it isn't perfect, because I can still see a couple of lines shining through, I think it was worth it. It costed a couple of euros and it just looks way better than the original one. So now where all the building is done, it's really time to install Windows on it, the drivers, the benchmarking software, the games, and then we will run all these benchmarks, the in-game benchmarks for games, and a couple of games here and there, and just compare the results we generate to the 500 euro PC and to the render machine, just to see how much more performance we can cramp out if we are willing to invest 250 euros more, or 750 in total, and if it was worth it. But I must say, I am expecting pretty good results right here. So after a light overclock of 4.2 GHz all core on the 3600X, XMP3000 enabled, and the afterburner auto overclock, and of course a day of testing, where do we stand? Well, first off, we need to mention that we had a small issue with this machine, because the fan splitter just decided to die, so we were hitting pretty high temps while doing our benchmarks, and it took us some time until we realized that the fans were not moving anymore. But as a quick fix, we just connected two of the three fans to individual headers, so that's why you can only see two of the fans moving right now. But anyway, this should be working for just fine for now, so let's get into the benchmarks. Starting off with synthetic CPU stuff. In Cinebench R20, we hit 3793 points. Somewhat the exact same result as the 500 euro PC, but they share the same CPU, so no wondering about that. In Passmark, we had a score of about 21,009, compared to the 19.8k from the 500 euro PC. Even though these tests are CPU only, the difference in results can be attributed to having 3000 MHz RAM instead of the 2133 that we used last time. In Novabench and 3D Mark, the same behavior can be found with 1684 points and 7305 points respectively. On the GPU side of things, it starts to get interesting. Here we will see that the 750 euro PC completely crushes the 500 euro PC by doubling the points to 6251 in Fur Mark and 3287 points in Ungen Superposition. Now on the RAM side, it also gets interesting as the much quicker RAM sticks in here are even competing against the Corsair Vengeance that were used in the render machine, as we can see in the Nova Bench speed of about 33,631. For the NVMe inside, we can take a look again at Nova Bench results, which only confirm what everybody was thinking. In fact, that it is indeed true that a M.2 NVMe drive 
is much quicker than a M.2 SATA drive. With the synthetics out of the way, it's time to take a look at in-game benchmarks. And just like we did with the other build, we will be testing each possible preset configuration for Shadow of the Tomb Raider as well as Metro Exodus. Now well last time the FPS counter already dropped under the 60 line after switching to medium, the 1660 Super that we are using in here allows for much more. Even with everything cranked up to the highest setting on 1080p and anti-aliasing on TAA, we are still able to keep up with 80 FPS on average. With 1440p, we start off with 85 FPS on low and are able to keep up with 66 FPS on medium and 64 FPS on high, which means that we should be able to have some light 1440p gaming with this machine. Because everything was going alright, we tried to hit the 1660 Super with some 4K footage. And even here it managed to keep 46 FPS on average. In Metro Exodus we had the same performance bump. We had 118 FPS on average 1080p low settings, 71 on normal, but going downhill from there with 53 on high, 42 on ultra and 25 on extreme. For 1440p we started off with 98 FPS but quickly fell down to 53 on normal, 41 on high, 34 on ultra and only 19 on extreme. Now just as we did with Shadow of the Tomb Raider, we tried our luck with 4K. And this gave us an unexpected result. It returned 64 FPS on low. But after seeing the 31 FPS on average for normal, we had to abandon the 4K. So after seeing that the synthetics were much better than the 5 from the PC, it's time to fire up some games. But this time we will not discuss every possible resolution and graphics settings combo, but we will only focus on the upper limits that we thought were important. So let's start off with real world Shadow of the Tomb Raider. 1080p was no issue here for the 1660 Super. So we just cranked up everything to the highest setting and we even tried out SMAA 4X anti-aliasing, which still gave us a good experience with 50 to 60 FPS. 1440p was a bit different, but after turning down the anti-aliasing to SMAA T2X and leaving the rest on highest, it turned out to be a good experience with again 50 to 60 FPS. In Crisis 3 on 1080p, we didn't even bother and started off with everything on very high and anti-aliasing on MSAA 8X, which yet again gave us 50 to 60 FPS with a couple of frame drops but overall alright. In 4040p we had to turn down the anti-aliasing to MSAA 2x and the overall settings to high to keep everything nice and smooth which gave us again 60 to 70 fps. And because Crisis was going so well we thought why not try 4k? With everything set to low the 1660 Super still managed to deliver around 50 fps on average. For GTA 5, which already ran exceptionally well on the 1650, we didn't even bother to try out 1080 or 1440p and we went straight to 4K with everything cranked up. This gave us a somewhat low score of around 30 to 40 FPS, but considering we are playing in 4K right now, it is also a very good result. So let's draw a conclusion. For 750 euro, you can get a machine which is perfectly capable of handling whatever title you want on 1080p and keep the FPS near the 3 digits as long as anti-aliasing is not hitting the roof. On the 1440p gaming side, it gets a bit harder. The settings cannot be cranked up as before, but still the 1660 Super can handle a lot. For 4K, this is far from a good option, but still we were able to play a couple of old titles. And even on the work side, with 16 gigs of RAM and the Ryzen 3600X on full potential, this is even a pretty good workstation for light to medium editing tasks, some rendering and maybe even some 4K footage. Now I must say that I am pretty impressed about what a difference the 250 euros made considering the 500 PC wasn't a failure either. And even more so if I look back like 10 years ago 
where a 750 euro PC could play some games, but cranking up the settings was a dream. But anyway, this here is the best we could come up with on a 750 euro budget and we are pretty happy with the result. So to wrap this video up, we hope that you've enjoyed the video and if you liked it, tell us with a thumb up or thumb down button and maybe even give us your opinion or better tell us what you would have made differently in the comments section. And of course, don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon to get notified about our next video. So thank you for watching and hopefully see you in the next one.